and welcome to our uh, first proper streamed service and uh, it's a bit of a trial at the moment to see how we get on we've had a few technical problems but we hope that uh, this will be something that we can take forward and bring people to worship together in their own homes at a time such as this now uh, this is passion sunday but because this is a trial because we're checking out um, the liturgy and just kind of to see how we're doing we've chosen uh, to do a the sunday morning service from our book the rhythm of life celtic daily liturgy and that's from david adam next week when we go into holy week we will be uh, hoping that everything else works we will be doing um, the traditional liturgy for our time of year so last week we had some traditional hymns this week we've got some more worship songs and as we go into holy week we will have a selection of both so i'm joined by some of our friends from st george's that you will see appearing on your screen uh, to do readings to do a poem and Roz will be bringing our word today so let's begin with a moment of quiet is the Graham Kendrick and Martin Smith version of Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Feel free to listen to the music or to sing along. So Sunday morning, resurrection, we decided that everybody needed a bit of hope. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choirs of angels. Alleluia. Christ, our King, is risen. Alleluia. Exalt all creation. Rejoice, O earth, in shining splendor. Alleluia. Christ our King is risen. Alleluia. Christ has conquered. Glory fills you. Christ our King is risen. Alleluia. 
Darkness vanishes forever. Christ dispels the darkness of our night. Alleluia. Christ, our King, is risen. Alleluia. Psalm 100. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. Christ is risen. Alleluia. And now we're going to have the first of our Bible reading uh, from the book of Ezekiel, and Guy is going to read that to us. The reading is taken from Ezekiel chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breathe from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life, and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is gone, we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is a song that Revelation often sing before the service. It's called Beautiful.
Our second reading is taken from uh, the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 11, beginning at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus, Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad smell, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth round his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. And now I'm going to invite Roz to come and share the word with us. Good morning, everyone. Most of the time we breathe in and out without even thinking about it. It's the most important thing we do. But as we're designed to do it automatically, we don't usually notice we're doing it. But breathing is literally a matter of life and death. And before I start speaking this evening, uh, sorry, this morning, I'd just like to hold before God all those who are struggling to breathe this morning, who are suffering with the coronavirus and acknowledge their struggle to survive, their battle to draw breath and ask God that he would give them new life.
and also at the same time to just acknowledge those who are nursing them. So this morning, we're looking at waking the dead. We're examining a complete valley of dried up human bones and investigating a dead body to see if the rumors are true. Do they come alive again? Is it really possible to waken the dead? So why a valley of dried bones? The people of Israel have been in exile for 10 years in Babylon and Jerusalem is destroyed. Their city and their temple have been smashed to the ground. All the disciplines of their spiritual life need the temple. So how do they continue living without it? And they're tempted to give up the ways of God and take on those of their Babylonian captors. But Ezekiel sees a way forward. He promises the restoration of Israel, a future life with God. But nothing seems to awaken his listeners. Why? Because to them, the nation of Israel is dead. Not just physically, because Jerusalem is destroyed, but spiritually as well, because the temple has been raised to the ground. They are just a valley of dried up old bones. What a stark picture this is. They feel they have no life left and all their vitality has been sapped out of them. But worst of all, they have no hope. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. And I wonder how many people around this morning feel like this due to this awful pandemic. Those who've lost loved ones and friends, those fearful for their futures, because at this point in time, they are vulnerable due to medical issues, or they have no money to pay bills and feed their families, or their businesses are teetering on the brink. Where can they find hope? Ezekiel shows us that God can change the future and bring new life to their situation. This is what the Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. His prophetic vision of new life breathed into the dried up bones of Israel gives us a picture of resurrection. God's spirit puts flesh on Israel's bones, breathes new life into them and raises up an army. Wow, the bones can't do this on their own. First, God restores their body, but it isn't until he breathes into them that they come alive and are raised up into an army. God doesn't just need our bodily presence. He needs us filled with his breath, his spirit, so we have his life in us, and then we're ready to go. So as a church, are we crying out to be raised up into an army ready to go in his name? to take new ground for the kingdom? Or are we just a valley of dried up old bones? We are called to be flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone, to be his body in a broken world, advancing the cause of the kingdom. Jesus needs our bodies as part of that army, but filled with his breath and not our own. So what areas feel dried up in our lives this morning? We might be like Ezekiel, who thought it was down to God to make the bones live. Only you know, Lord. But God tells Ezekiel to speak to the bones, to prophesy over them. So we can, like Ezekiel, speak the life of God into the dry, dead areas of our lives and see them renewed. We can also speak the life of God into the dry, dead areas in our families and friends and into broken and hurting relationships and into the lives of our churches. I also believe we can speak the life of God into our nation and the whole world at this difficult time. So as you pray in the coming weeks for people or countries by name, imagine bones coming to life and breath entering them, chasing coronavirus away and bringing life and health. So next, we have a four days dead body in a tomb to examine. Lazarus is ill. They send for Jesus, but he doesn't come and Lazarus dies. They put him in a tomb and roll a stone across the entrance. And Jesus turns up four days late. So Lazarus is well and truly dead. And Martha greets him with an accusation. 
Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Quite understandably, she's cross. It's taken him so long to get there. And Jesus replies, I am the resurrection and the life. Not I could be or I will be. I am now right here. And he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus wants Martha to have faith now that he holds the power of life and death. So he asks her, do you believe this? She replies, I believe. Even in these very difficult circumstances, Martha has faith and is obedient. And this is our hope as followers of Jesus. If we believe in him, we will never die. He gives us life beyond the grave. And Jesus' love for this family from Bethany, and he isn't afraid to show his emotions. He weeps with Mary because he can feel her pain and loss. But some of his emotion is anger. Deeply moved as a euphemism for angry. Jesus is angry that death has snatched Lazarus from them, but not for long. He sees it as a thief snatching life away that should belong to us. Jesus asked Martha to roll back the gravestone. She thinks Jesus has gone mad and that Lazarus will stink, but she does it anyway. And then we have the dramatic scene when Jesus prays to his father and calls Lazarus out of the tomb. And just as God uses Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and his spirit to breathe new life into them, he uses Jesus to speak to Lazarus's bones and his spirit to breathe new life into him. Sometimes God's plans and purposes can't be set in motion in our lives because we have buried parts of ourselves, entombed them, and put a stone in front of them just to make sure nothing or nobody can disturb them. They might be buried hopes and dreams, hurts and disappointments. <clears throat> what lies buried or contained in us that Jesus wants to resurrect? Jesus is calling us this morning to believe for these things again, to give everything to him that holds us back so he can breathe new life into them and bring his healing love and forgiveness and set us free. Our grave clothes can come off as we're no longer bound. I just quickly want to read a poem by Joy Cowley called Lazarus. I, didn't, I don't intend it to happen. It just sneaks up on me. And before I know it, there's been a kind of death. Part of me wrapped in a shroud and buried in a tomb, while the rest of me stands by wondering why the light has gone out. Then you, my friend, all-knowing, seek me out and knock at the edge of my heart, calling me to come forth. I argue that I can't. Death <coughs> is death, and I'm too far gone for storybook miracles. But you keep on calling. Come forth, come forth. And the darkness is pierced by the shaft of light as a stone begins to move. My friend, I don't know how you do it, but the tomb has become as bright as day, as bright as love, and life has returned. Look at me, I'm running out, dropping bandages all over the place. So all the things that we're hiding from God or others because we're ashamed of them are actually unborn resurrection. We just have to hand them over to Jesus so they can be made new. And Jesus wants to call forth his plans and purposes for our lives, for our church, our village and our nation. He wants to release us into our God-given destinies. And it's never too late. Remember, Jesus said, I am, not I was or I will be. And we know this story isn't about Lazarus. It's about Jesus, who he is and what he can do. With Easter only two weeks away, he's preparing them all for what is about to happen. By raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus counters Satan's lie that death is the end. Lazarus must have been unstoppable after his resurrection. What did he have to lose? But haven't we been saved from death and given a new life too? I wonder if we had a spiritual health check at the Well Christian Clinic, what it would reveal. Are we a pile of dry bones? Are we fleshed out in our body, but spiritually asleep, occasionally waking up if something stirs us? Or are we alive, 
full of the breath of God and standing in the ranks of that mighty army ready to go. Jesus needs us now. It's a matter of life and death, as he's the only hope for this world. I am the resurrection, the life, says Jesus. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Amen. Thank you, Roz. Just to say, there have been a few technical difficulties in this going out live but we are recording it so we will put it up afterwards in its entirety for you to see if your viewing has been interrupted the song of christ's glory at the name of jesus every knee shall bow christ jesus was in the form of god but he did not cling to equality with god at the name of jesus every knee shall bow. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, and was born in our human likeness. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your disciples, I am with you always. Be with us today as we offer ourselves to you. Hear our prayers for others and for ourselves, and keep us in your care. Amen. Let us pray to God, who alone makes us dwell in safety. For all who are affected by coronavirus, through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they might find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For doctors, nurses and medical researchers, that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the isolated and housebound, that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. <clears throat> Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For a blessing on our local community, that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship, where all are known and cared for. 
Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For children and young people out of school and college and those who care for them, that they may all have the patience that they need. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For households under pressure and in financial stress, that they may have the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the church at this time of change and challenge, that we might be salt and light in our communities. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now read one of my poems called Lessons in Hope. Hope helps a stream during daylight to welcome the impossible. It is our legacy and yet by giving it away we gain. Hope looks ahead with a gleaming telescope. A warm day in winter, freedom from pain, a cure for the incurable. Hope will surprise you when you least expect it. A fresh fall of snow, the high brown fritillary, small cracks that appear on a quail's egg. Hope is in that moment before creation, a sculpture already sits within the stone. The maypole ribbons hang loose, a harmony burgeons from your mind. Hope can be found in the action itself. A ship sets sail on a squally sea. A swallow returns to last summer's barn. Someone is pulled back from the edge. Hope can be heard if you listen hard in the footfall on gravel, the pause between tears and the flutter of the angel's wings. Splendour of the King and the chorus goes, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God.
Elizabeth. Now we come to a responsory, and as I say, the words risen Christ, the responses give us hope. That we may rejoice in the resurrection, risen Christ, give us hope. That we may know that you have conquered death, risen Christ, give us hope. That we may know that you have triumphed over the grave, risen Christ, give us hope. That those in doubt and despair may see your light, risen Christ, give us hope. That those who are troubled in mind may know your peace, risen Christ, give us hope that those in pain and distress may know your presence. Risen Christ, give us hope. That those caring for the terminally ill may know your power. Risen Christ, give us hope. That those who mourn may discover the joy of life eternal. Risen Christ, give us hope. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us, that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life, and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The God of hope who brought again from the dead that great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus Christ, fill us with all joy and peace in believing. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.